Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a woman telephoning a tourist office to ask about free activities. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Good morning, this is Burnham Tourist Office, Martin speaking. Oh, hello. I saw a poster about free things to do in the area and it said people should phone you for information. I'm coming to Burnham with my husband and two children for a few days on June the 27th or possibly the 28th and I'd like some ideas for things to do on the 29th. Yes, of course. OK. Then let's start with a couple of events especially for children. The Art Gallery is holding an event called Family Welcome that day when there are activities and trails to use throughout the gallery. That sounds interesting. What time does it start? The gallery opens at 10 and the family welcome event runs from 10.30 until 2 o'clock. The gallery stays open until 5 and several times during the day they're going to show a short film that the gallery has produced. It demonstrates how ceramics are made and there'll be equipment and materials for children to have a go themselves. Last time they ran the event there was a film about painting which went down very well with the children and they're now working on one about sculpture. I like the sound of that. And what other events happen in Burnham? Well, do you all enjoy listening to music? Oh, yes. Well, there are several free concerts taking place at different times, one or two in the morning, the majority at lunchtime and a couple in the evening. And they range from pop music to Latin American. The Latin American could be fun. What time is that? It's being repeated several times in different places. They're performing in the Central Library at one o'clock. Then at four, it's in the City Museum. And in the evening at 7.30, there's a longer concert in the theatre. Right. I'll suggest that to the rest of the family. Something else you might be interested in is the boat race along the river. Oh, yes. Do tell me about that. The race starts at Offord Marina to the north of Burnham and goes as far as Summer Pool. The best place to watch it from is Charlesworth Bridge, though that does get rather crowded. And who's taking part? Well, local boat clubs, but the standard is very high. One of them came first in the West of England Regional Championship in May this year. It was the first time a team from Burnham has won. It means that next year, they'll be representing the region in the National Championship. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now I've heard something about Paxton Nature Reserve. It's a good place for spotting unusual birds, isn't it? That's right, throughout the year. There is a lake there as well as a river and they provide a very attractive habitat. So it's a good idea to bring binoculars if you have them. And just at the moment you can see various flowers that are pretty unusual. The soil at Paxton isn't very common. They're looking good right now. Right. My husband will be particularly interested in that. And there's going to be a talk and slideshow about mushrooms, and you'll be able to go out and pick some afterwards and study the different varieties. Uh-huh. And is it possible for children to swim in the river? Yes. Part of it has been fenced off to make it safe for children to swim in. It's very shallow, and there's a lifeguard on duty whenever it's open. The lake is too deep, so swimming isn't allowed there. OK, we must remember to bring their swimming things in case we go to Paxton. How long does it take to get there by car from Burnham? Mm, about 20 minutes, 
but parking is very limited, so it's usually much easier to go by bus. And it takes about the same time. Right. Well, I'll discuss the options with the rest of the family. Thanks very much for all your help. You're welcome. Goodbye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a woman talking on a radio program about a festival that is about to take place. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 18 on page 3. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 18. I have in the studio with me Mary Smith from Yorktown Tourism, who is here to tell us about some of the events happening in our state capital over the next three weeks at the Spring Festival. So, Mary, what can we expect to see? Well, it's such an exciting time to be in Yorktown. To kick off the Spring Festival, there'll be a huge firework display down by the lake starting at 9 p.m. this Saturday, the 4th of September. Over 10,000 fireworks will be set off, all choreographed to music and broadcast simultaneously here on Radio Yorkie. You should get there early if you want to get close to the action. So, bring along a picnic and a blanket, as it could get chilly in the evening. One of the things that attracts visitors to the festival from all over the country is the amazing collection of flowers on show in Central Park throughout the festival. Special buses will run from the town centre to the show at 20-minute intervals for those of you who prefer to take public transport. If you're interested in seeing the latest in cars, from the fastest to the most expensive, then head over to the Motor Show at the Exhibition Centre from the 10th to the 15th of September. It'll be open daily from 9am until 10pm. So you can even pop there after work. Do you like photography? Then go along to Grow Your Imagination, an exhibition of photographs of famous gardens, which will be held at the Art Gallery from the 11th to the 19th of September. Come and be inspired by some of the world's most beautiful gardens. I've had a sneak preview of some of the photographs, and they are magnificent. If music is more your scene, then you should come and hear the Australian Philharmonic Orchestra performing Swing in Spring at the Concert Hall on Friday the 17th and Saturday the 18th of September. It's a celebration of dance music from the 1940s and 50s. There'll be three performances. Both evenings start at 7pm and a matinee performance at 2.30 on the Saturday. So... Get your dancing shoes on and head there. It's guaranteed to get your feet tapping. Before you hear the rest of the program, you have some time to look at questions 19 and 20 on page 4. Now listen and answer questions 19 and 20. Those are 
just a few of the attractions on offer. But for something a little different, you could try Balloons Down Under, which is the largest gathering of hot air balloons in the Southern Hemisphere. It's well worth it, because there'll be over 25 balloons of all shapes and sizes, which is a truly amazing sight. I'm also happy to announce that one lucky person will get the chance to go up in one of these balloons absolutely free. That's the prize in our special spring festival competition. It'd normally cost you $200, so it's not a bad prize, eh? I'm sure you all want a chance to win, so you'll need to fill out the entry form in today's edition of the Yorktown News. Don't forget to include your phone number and send it to Radio Yorkie. Make sure your entry reaches us by 5pm on Thursday the 9th of September. Then, to see if you've won, just check out the festival's website on Saturday the 11th of September, where we'll publish the name of the lucky winner. It's such a fantastic prize, so hurry up and get your entry in. So, there you have it. Just a few of the special events happening here in Yorktown over the Spring Festival. And if you'd like any more details about the That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part three. You'll hear a student called Paul talking to a tutor about a course he is thinking of doing. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25 on page five. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning. Come in. You're Paul, are you? Yes. I spoke to you on the phone. Yes. Have a seat. You wanted to talk to me about the archaeology course? Yes. Uh, I've read the handbook, but I'd like to find out a few more details before I decide whether to do it. Right. Yes. What would you like to know? Well, first of all, can I combine the archaeology course with one in anthropology? Yes, you can combine it with any other subject apart from classical history. Hmm. That's simply because there's some overlap in the lecture times for those two courses. We weren't able to coordinate them. Okay, fine. And could you tell me about the modules? Well, in the first semester, there are three. All of them are compulsory. We don't offer optional modules till next year. Right. The first one focuses on what can be learned from specific artifacts, such as pottery and stone tools. It's called Object Matters, and it's taught by Dr. Morris. Is that... Uh, how is the module presented? I mean, is it lectures? We refer to the means of presentation as the learning method, and in this case, it's lectures integrated with practical sessions, so it's a mixture. What about the content? I suppose we'll be looking at different kinds of archaeological remains, and how to date them and so on. To some extent, but the module is basically about processes, First of all, recording material, then classification, then interpretation of the data. That's how archaeologists draw conclusions about their findings. And finally, display. Is that okay? I think so. Yes, thanks. Uh, one other thing. How is the module assessed? Is there an exam? No, it's all based on coursework. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30 on page 6.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Okay. And the second module, that's the one called Towns and Cities, is taught by our department head, Professor Elliot. And as the name suggests, the module's about the origins of built environments and how they developed. That's mainly factual then, I suppose? It is really. And for that reason, the assessment's by examination. But you may be pleased to know it's an oral rather than a written exam, and... It sounds a bit scary. <laughs> Most of our students find they actually enjoy it, so don't worry too much. OK. And then the title of the third module is Method and Science. And in that, Dr. Thompson will be introducing you to the standard techniques used in archaeological fieldwork and analysis. Things like excavating and dating. What about the learning method for this module? Are there any lectures, or is this all laboratory work? Oh, it's half lab work and half seminars. There aren't any lectures. Then, right at the end of the module, you'll take part in a site survey. The date for that is week beginning the 10th of March, but I can't tell you the location yet. That'll be announced later. But I think you'll find it very useful. Yes, I know someone who went on that last... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a talk about the effects of our digital world on young people. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 7 and 8. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this lecture series, we're looking at changes occurring due to the rapid spread of digital technology in the last decades of the 20th century. By digital technology, I include any computer-related devices such as email, the internet, cell phones, instant messaging, to name but a few. Today's lecture focuses on the ideas of Mark Prensky and what he believes are the major effects that high exposure to digital technology has had on young people today. Firstly, what exactly does Prensky believe? He argues that because today's young people have been born into a digital world, and spend hours simply playing with technology, they've changed in fundamental ways. He believes they're evolving differently, and as a result, process information differently from previous generations. It's even possible that these young people's brains have physically changed, although whether this is literally true isn't yet known. Nor does Prensky go quite this far. Prensky divides people into digital natives and digital immigrants. Today's young people are the digital natives, and they belong in this new digital age because they were born into it and grew up as native speakers of the digital language of computer technology, whereas digital immigrants are those born in the generations before the digital age. Just as those who learn a second language often retain their foreign accent, the immigrants are usually, in varying degrees, not quite as effective at speaking the digital language as the natives are. For example, they're more comfortable finding phone numbers using a phone book or looking up information in an encyclopedia, rather than using the Internet as a primary source of information. Prensky calls this the digital accent. Another example of the digital accent is scanning a manual for a computer program 
rather than assuming the program itself will teach you how to use it. Basically, people with a digital accent have never really stopped relying on their original non-digital means of sourcing information. They prefer doing things as they've always done them, without typing something into a computer. Prensky predicts that due to all this, changes are in store, mainly in the area of education. But what do other educators and theorists such as Thomas Allen, Samuel James, and Peter Vander believe? Samuel James, from Sydney University, agrees with Prensky's predictions. He believes that educators are no longer successful in the way they teach. However, not surprisingly, Prensky has been criticized by more traditional theorists, like Peter Vander and Thomas Allen. They disagree with many of Prensky's assertions. Vander argues that a typical classroom is more varied than Prensky believes, with students coming from a range of backgrounds. He maintains that a large percentage of these students are not necessarily proficient with technology, and not all students today fit the one stereotype. And Allen adds that even though most students today have easy access to technology, some just don't find the digital medium appealing. James disagrees, though. He believes that all today's students do share the same basic interest in and knowledge of digital technology. However, James believes our younger students can communicate with their digital immigrant teachers and can still learn using methods which have proven to be successful in the past. James's theories are taken a step further by Allen, who recognizes that both digital immigrants and natives have to deal with vast amounts of information in today's electronic society. Allen maintains that while most young students are proficient in playing computer games and using the web in quite basic ways, they're not used to using the computer at advanced levels. For example, to conduct complex information searches, which are so necessary for university study today. Irrespective of Allen's research, James believes it's possible for computer games to play a major role in making classroom learning more stimulating, and he cites many instances where this would be possible today. However, Vander asserts that rather than focusing on developing games, we should think of better ways to assist teachers, because no computer program comes close to doing what a human teacher does every day. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. While achieving a Band 9 score on the IELTS, or any standardized test for that matter, within a week is highly unlikely. There are definitely steps you can take to maximize your score in a short time frame. Here's a more comprehensive approach to optimize your performance in a limited time. Assessment and Prioritization Initial Evaluation Begin by taking a full-length practice test under timed conditions simulating the actual exam environment. This will provide a clear picture of your current strengths and weaknesses across the listening, reading, writing, and speaking sections. Targeted practice. Instead of spreading yourself thin across all areas, identify the sections where you scored the lowest. Dedicate the majority of your remaining time to focused practice on these specific areas. Strategic preparation. Official resources. Utilize official IELTS practice tests and learning materials from organizations like the British Council or IDP Education. These resources are specifically designed to familiarize you with the test format, question types, and assessment criteria. Test simulation. 
Regularly practice under time conditions to build stamina, manage exam anxiety, and enhance your focus during the actual test. Aim to replicate the real exam environment as closely as possible, including minimizing distractions and using similar testing materials. 